Gracious and loving God, may only your words be spoken. May only your words be heard. Amen. In his letter to the church at Corinth, St. Paul draws for his readers an image of the Jewish people as still having a veil between them and the truth of the love of God. Cutting Paul the greatest slack possible, he is guilty of tearing down another group in an attempt to build his own people up. It is very problematic, and it is dangerous. It is this language we hear in our churches that, left unexamined, feeds the idea that our Jewish siblings are less than, and that they are in need of conversion at our sometimes threatening and too often violent hands. There is a desire by many in the church to have readings like this stricken from our lectionary cycle. It is exhausting to have to unpack these readings every single time they appear. And it is lethal to our Jewish siblings not to. If we hide these readings though, and others like it, they are still there part of our sacred book. By ignoring them, we become ill-equipped to address them, to critique them, and, as appropriate, to condemn them. Our sacred story is filled with images that we, as children of a loving God and as followers of Jesus, must face head-on, engage with, and argue over in an unending pursuit of the truth that reveals to us God's dream for the world God has made. And today's Gospel from Luke, it provides a very different relationship between Jesus' followers and the Jewish faith that they practice. This final epiphany in the season of epiphanies tells the story we know as the transfiguration, the revelation of, God, of Jesus as God's chosen one, on top of a mountain, standing with Moses and Elijah. In this story, in which Peter and James and John learn who Jesus is again, Jesus is not above the Jewish faith. He is not beyond it. He is immersed in it. He is surrounded by it, literally in conversation with it, as he is seen talking to Elijah and Moses. So please, friends, listen to Paul, but do so with, as the academics like to call it, a hermeneutic of suspicion. As I wrote this preamble to my sermon of sorts, it occurred to me that my desire to write it and my ability to preach it here in this congregation and my hope and belief that you will hear it comes only as a result of an epiphany of my own, a transfiguration experience in my own life. There is a popular axiom on the internet that goes, oh, I can't unsee that. It is used usually in reference to bizarre or disturbing images. You know, like after watching your rector tap dance at a talent show, <laughs> you might turn to the person sitting next to you and say, well, I can't unsee that. P.S. That is not happening this morning <laughs> at our talent show. In researching that phrase, I can't unsee that, I found what is to be believed to be one of the earliest expressions of that phrase on the internet. Canadian cartoonist David Sim wrote, quote, 
Once a profound truth has been seen, it cannot be unseen. There is no going back to the person you were, even if such a possibility did exist. Why would you want to? That quote is the essence of what I understand the transfiguration to mean for Peter and James and John, for Jesus, for you, for me. Once a profound truth has been seen, it cannot be unseen. There is no going back to the person you were before. Even if such a possibility did exist, why would you want to? Having journeyed up the mountain with Jesus and having experienced this supernatural event of seeing the prophets and Jesus glowing like Moses did before him, the cloud covering them and the voice from heaven declaring Jesus God's beloved, it is all gone just as quickly as it had arrived. But what they had seen could not be unseen. What they now know could never be unknown, and they would never be the same because of it. The world into which they descend from the mountaintop is, of course, the very same world that they had left to go up. It was the same world, and it was completely different. Completely different for them, and completely different for Jesus. The scene into which they descend tells of a man who asks Jesus to heal his child after having asked his followers to, and they could not. Jesus is exasperated, frustrated with the crowd's inability to do the work of God without him present, having to do it on their behalf. The world was the same. The very same scene might have been happening before the mountain, but maybe they walked right by it. Perhaps they didn't notice the ill child or hear the cries of the desperate father. But what they saw on the mountain they could not unsee, and they would never be the same. Jesus' ministry takes a drastic turn on that mountaintop. From here on in, the road Jesus is on leads directly to the cross. Once the glory of God is seen, it cannot be unseen. Once the shining light and resounding voice of God's justice and peace and love has been seen and heard and felt, the world in which we have always lived our lives often looks completely different to us. What was once bearable becomes somehow unbearable. What might have been tolerable becomes intolerable. What had been invisible is now as bright as the face of God. We only feel for the suffering of this world because we know it can and should be different. We only hear the cries of the poor and the oppressed because we have heard the voice of love and of justice. We only see the injustice of the world because we have an idea of the justice and peace God desperately longs for us to receive. All of this leads me back to my preface for this sermon. You know, I have heard that reading from Corinthians at least once every three years for 53 years. So probably 17 times at least. And how many times have I heard it or even read it? How often was I unable to hear the danger in Paul's words? Over the past decade or so, though, I have intentionally learned and listened to my Jewish siblings and colleagues, to academics and theologians, to 
to friends and family, to you. And now I cannot unsee what I have seen. I cannot unhear what I have heard or unknow what I now know. The reading hasn't changed, but I have. My son goes to Curry College. You may have read in the news that Curry College has had a series of racist and anti-Semitic graffiti and threatening language found on bathroom stalls and walls on campus. It has resulted in the college going fully online for classes two days over the past few weeks. The college has sent out notices to all students and their families every single time they have found something on campus. A comment to Paul that I wished they wouldn't let people know every single time. I wondered why they didn't just clean the wall and move on. Imagine, I said, if our parents, when we were kids, got a phone call every single time there was hate language on a bathroom stall in our high school. Every time there was a swastika drawn or a racist or homophobic slur scrawled. And then I let myself wonder just that. What if they had, 35 years ago, treated those cowardly acts of hate the way they were treating them now? How might my world have been different? 35 years ago, those words struck terror in my heart whenever I saw them on a bathroom mirror or someone's locker or my own. But I didn't know then that it didn't need to be an acceptable part of the life of a teenager and young adult. 35 years ago, the horrors of war were veiled to me. Now the images of Ukrainians hiding in subway stations and Russians marching for peace grip my heart and bring me to my knees. If you are wondering what is happening in this world, where God is in all of this, if things seem like they are getting worse rather than better, well, maybe that is what is happening. Or maybe, just maybe, your heart knows something now it is not known before. Maybe your eyes can see now what they had not before been able to see. Your ears now hearing what had always been spoken, but remained unheard by too many of us for far too long. Maybe the world hasn't changed. Maybe you have. Maybe we are. Perhaps we are witnessing a world post some transfiguration. A world in which anything short of the kingdom of God on earth is simply not acceptable. This reading of Jesus' transfiguration is chosen as the reading for the last Sunday of Epiphany, because this Sunday serves as the tipping point between the epiphanies of this season and the call to repentance and renewal we are offered in the season of Lent that awaits us. Between the mountaintop and the empty tomb on Easter morning, there is a great deal of pain to be witnessed. There are tables to be turned, and there are thieves to forgive. There is betrayal, and there is denial, there is desert, and there is temptation. For 40 days, we will walk with Jesus down from the mountaintop toward the cross, together, all the while begging God, have mercy on us. Christ, have mercy on us. Lord, have mercy on us. The world in which we live is the same world in which we have always lived. The good old days 
They weren't good for everyone. We are not called simply to get things back to the way they were before, but to make them better. To make the world more loving, more filled with the peace of God, more ruled by God's justice than humanity's greed and fear and senseless hate. God in Jesus has shown us what is possible when we let God rule our hearts. Jesus has shown us what is possible. And we dare not unsee what we have seen. Once a profound truth has been seen, it cannot be unseen. There is no going back to the person you were before. Even if such a possibility did exist, why would you want to? For the love of God, why would you want to?